This is a production of Cornell University. This is called Protect Your Bald Head Hat, is what this is. <laughs> so what we're going to do, uh, Mike Brown, who is my, this guy is the best research support specialist. Thank you. Certainly in New York State, possibly in the Northeast. Uh, Mike has been really my right-hand man for, what, 12 years? 13 12 years? years? And Greg was also involved in, in quite a bit of the work that we're going to look at, so I, I want them both to come with me. And um, we're going to just do a quick walkthrough, because it doesn't look like it's going to rain. We're going to go through the orchard up here, and Greg, I, I'm hoping you can talk, since this is Greg's PhD. And then we'll swing through, and I'll talk a little bit about apple replant work. And, and then we'll probably come back, so we're just going to... It's full bloom. We've got to have an excuse to walk in the orchard. So let's go this way. So this was uh, Greg's PhD planning. So I'm gonna, I want Greg to do most of the talking. A little bit of the history of it. Uh, this is Liberty, which is a lot of people consider it the most disease resistant apple that's ever been developed. It's a Cornell Apple uh, has Macown and a bunch of other stuff in its parentage. And uh, Rick Risinger, Rick's not here, but he was a really key person that I worked with during the 90s. Uh, most of the trees that you see, except for those I think Rick planted, it was fabulous having an orchard manager who was as much of a fanatic as I was about planting new stuff and, and seeing how it did. So we planted this in 1994 just because we wanted to have some scab immune stuff here and uh, to work with. So Greg, why don't you tell us about this? Sure. You got a holler. So this is uh, a whole plot. It's about, um, about an acre or so. It's all Liberty on M9, a dwarfing rootstock. And it was planted here for different purposes. And actually, uh, um, the summer before I came in, Ian had two undergraduate students, uh, Emily Bulmer and Christine Averill, um, started on a project here looking at organic systems and um, integrated fruit production, which is the conventional system in, in Europe um, to the state, really, which is a low input, soft uh, program integrating uh, insect control and, and nutrient management and water management into a system. And so the, the goal of the project was to really look at can we do organic here in the Northeast, which is very difficult with the large pest complex that we have, 50 some odd arthropod pests and another 20 uh, different fungi and bacteria and other, other disease agents that, that really are uh, uh, difficult to control even in conventional systems. But can we do it in an organic system? And, and also let's look at this European system, this IFP system. So we had um, four replications of each of the treatments in this plot here. And I ran the study for, we had four years of data on it and looked at everything from soil ecology through um, productivity of the trees, fruit quality, nutraceutical content of the fruit, uh, consumer sensory panels, environmental impact. So it was a very holistic sort of project. Um, and we saw, uh, wrote the publication that Ian showed as well out of the, out of the organic side of the work here. Um, long and short of it is that, yeah, you can do organic if the premium is high enough to get the return on investment, which is required for the additional pests, pest control practices that you need to do, and the uh, uh, loss of fruit, somewhat smaller fruit size that you get, and the additional hand labor. But, um, but it's doable, and it's an economic question more than a, than a feasibility question. Um, even with that, though, um, hasn't really taken off. We were hoping, you know, maybe some people would be interested in. I, I know anecdotally, there's some still some experimentation with organic in the Northeast, um, but we'll see where the future is. The IFP system um, has largely been incorporated into new systems such as the GAP, the um, uh, um, good, good agricultural, agricultural practices. Uh, systems that are now that the supermarkets, the retailers are really requiring for the growers. So slowly that's becoming the standard here as it as it has in Europe as well. So um, yeah, I spent a lot of time out here. It's probably the most micromanaged organic plots in, in, in the Northeast at the time. And uh, is it still being managed organically? It is, yep. It's still being managed. So it's Actually, the whole block is now. 
down to the edge and we had the Nofa New York inspector here when was that Eric a year ago about and they looked at it and basically said no problem if you want to certify it Great. Now, this is one of the few organic comparisons with other systems that was actually replicated uh, instead of pseudo replicated where you're comparing this farm to that farm <laughs> Um, and it actually worked really well. I think it was a good experimental design that we had set here. So, and this is the only planting I've ever managed that I've gotten a call from environmental health and safety and said, what the hell are you guys doing out there? It smells like there's a bunch of dead fish. And that's because the thinning treatment that we use here is lime sulfur and Crocker's fish oil. And uh, it, it's a, uh, if, if you've driven in here in the summer, this whole thing is whitewashed. That's the surround. Very effective organic uh, insect repellent. And the thinning that we do is lime sulfur. It's a combination of dead fish and rotten eggs. It's great stuff to work with. But, uh, I, I describe uh, it as Jersey Shore, and apologies to those who are from the Jersey Shore. But uh, it smells like that. And just coincidentally, and every year it turned out this way, and I didn't do it on purpose, but it always turned out I had to put that application on a commencement weekend. Uh, <laughs> I don't know, it just turned out that way. Yeah, I'm, I, you know, I'm a believer in quitting while you're ahead. Hey, Taryn! Yeah. I want you to talk about your root boxes. Just yeah. a little bit, you gotta holler. Oh man. Uh. I'll stand, I'll stand here, okay. We can, <laughs> yeah. I wish, well, I wish we had one open. Um, so, well, these are root boxes, as Ian mentioned. They are basically, um, if we could pull the lid off of one of these, what you would find inside is basically uh, mylar sheets on each side of these root boxes so that we can actually observe um, the roots growing against them over time. The problem with apples is that unlike almost every other tree crop plant I've ever worked with, they have such a minimal root system compared um, comparatively and so we have a really actually difficult time finding roots on these trees and so these were installed about a year ago or so now, but it'll be exciting this spring to open them up and, and see what we found. Um, last year when we checked them, there was hardly anything there and it was somewhat disappointing, but fingers are crossed for this year and, and hopefully we'll find something. Are they worse than grapes? Oh, Much worse. worse. Grapes have like 10 times yeah, as many roots. Grapes are the poster child. <laughs> yeah. yeah, we had, I think we had uh, 60 observation to how many did we have out here, Mike, when we had the Rhizotron tubes? Was it 60? Yeah, in that ballpark, yeah. And uh, the work when Shangri was coming doing weekly observations, I think we only ended up with something like 80 roots in the yeah. whole Dan Orchard that happened to be next to the tube. I mean, you actually made me kind of nervous when the, when the wind blows, I think, yeah, oh, yeah. My, the orchard's just going to blow away because they don't have much of a root yeah. system. Sometimes I'm amazed at how apples uh, do it with such a minimal root system. I don't, it's amazing. Yeah. They must I be really incredibly like, mycorrhizal is all so, I can yeah, say. Yeah, yeah. And the roots are, There's a study. the ones they do have are pretty active, I think. Yes, uh, I would agree. So. Uh, this, the question was, what's the rootstock? There are six different rootstocks here. So this is the replant experiment that I was talking about in there. The old tree rows went this way, and the preplant treatments went this way, and they're blocked five times from east to west. And then the, so there were four preplant treatments, you remember, blocked, repped five times by the blocks. And then each tree basically is, they've all got, well, most of them still have tags. Um, they, it's a, each tree is a replicate of the factorial combination, so. And it's been pretty stunning, uh, the differences. Even now, I mean, that, that, even after, what, 10 years, I guess, right? It was 2001 when we actually planted these trees. They just, they're not converging at all. And usually in a replant study where people uh, have looked at fumigation as a treatment, you get this big difference for three or four years where the trees and fumigated ground are just bigger and more productive. And then after about 10 years, they kind of come together and that has not happened with these rootstocks. So it's pretty amazing. Yeah, this was for me for 20 years, you know, I would work on replant and it was all totally empirical. We'd do something 
and then we'd come back and we'd measure how the trees grew or how much fruit they produced or how much nitrogen they took up and this was the first time we ever said you know what I want to know why are they doing what they're doing it was really the one of the first mechanistic and it was great being able to work with Janice and having grad students you know Greg also uh, did a fair amount of molecular work in the Liberty there for me it was a it was a big step to just sort of make that transition to and I used to be one of those somewhat of a Luddite I guess where I'd you know we all used to make nasty remarks about molecular biologists and you know how they weren't doing anything useful but it's well, I've really come to realize that was pretty stupid because <laughs> the truth is it's just they're just techniques and they're incredibly powerful techniques that you can apply in agricultural systems that enable you to understand what's what's happening why it's happening how it's happening it's it's really powerful stuff so if you're a student and you think oh this is not my cup of tea uh, so like I always, Greg can attest, I always told my students, you're going to learn how to apply this, these techniques while you're here because you're a, it's crazy if you don't. So. Well, sorry, and tell us. Let's keep walking. Um, so they could be uh, used in breeding groups. Oh, uh, yeah. Yeah, I mean, we published that. All that when stuff Martin is in and the paper. I so. threatened to lie down in front of the bulldozer when our... Our uh, various people wanted to get rid of these trees over the years. These are the oldest trees in the whole orchard. 19, actually we don't know. The truth of the matter is we didn't keep very good records in this orchard. We don't even know exactly when the first trees were planted here. We think it was around 1908 or 1909. Uh, but these trees are probably from the early 1920s. I suppose, where's Ken? Some, we need a dendrochronologist out here actually to, to take some. Take a core and tell us exactly when these trees were planted. So we we keep them around. The the guys and the crew understandably are it's a lot of work. I actually used to prune these with my orchard management class until the risk assessment people said, you know, maybe you shouldn't have students on 18 foot ladders with chainsaws. You know, that's not quite. Um, but it's it's uh i love having him here because this this is kind of the history of the apple and it, it's really good for students to be able to show them this is what orchards look like 40 by 40 feet uh and the other remarkable thing i mean look at the bloom this tree is almost 100 years old and it's just raring to go so hope springs eternal this is a good thing to look at when you're about to retire here right it's, so no these are all grafted on seedling roots and there are Cortlands. They're, these may be the oldest living Cortland trees. These are Cortlands before they were called. Cortland. Before it was a name variety. Yeah. And Cortland, uh, for those who aren't familiar, it's a Cornell apple. One of the earliest introductions of the Geneva apple breeding program. McCown and Cortland were right back there in about the same era, early 1900s. I think 1923 was when Cortland was named, if I remember correctly. So, so we'll quickly walk through here. Justine, can you come here for a sec? So I want Justine to talk a little bit about this this vineyard. <laughs> what would you like to decide? Just tell us, tell us why it's here. What do we do with it? All right, so uh, this is one of our teaching vineyards, and we call it the Pool Block, named after Bob Pool, who was a viticulturist. Um, he was my favorite viticulturist. <laughs> who uh, who designed this? Uh, and so there's a real mix of stuff um, through here. At the, at the very far end, and I'm guessing we're going to walk that way, there's actually the Geneva Double Curtain, which is a, a very good trailing system that, that came out of uh, research at Geneva by Nelson Schaller, where he divided the canopy. He did all the research down in Fredonia, and those people are upset that it is called the Geneva Double Curtain <laughs> and not the Fredonia Double Curtain. And seriously, it, it is a difficult topic down there. Um, but it was uh, then widely used by the concrete industry for a long time and for, is starting to fall out of favor now. Uh, and then he put in a, a, a rotational program so that students could work with a very young vines. So we've got concrete and Seval uh, that range from zero to five years. Uh, and then some uh, different uh, spacings of vines and fur prune versus cane prune. We've got some of uh, what at the time were Bruce's grooving selections, but are now named cultivars. So there's some Coronoir uh, through here, which was, was the 
um, the 70 number, right? The New York 70. Um, plus some older Dishonak too. For Dishonak, one thing we do, and and uh, and Steve Lurch does a lot of the the work in here for teaching purposes, is we'll prune the Dishonak to zero nodes, so no nodes at all, so it technically shouldn't have any yield. But that crazy cultivar will go six times an acre on zero uh, zero nodes because it, it's really really fruitful from the, the latent bud. Uh, and then there's a, a whole selection of table grapes. Uh, which Eric and the guys take care of and then uh, harvest and sell here at the <coughs> store. Um, beautiful, beautiful grapes, most of them from uh, the Cornell Brewing Program, stuff like Mindset Seedless uh, is a popular one, and Canada is that too, right? Um, so that's what we basically have in, in this block. We've got a couple other uh, teaching blocks, one up on the, that we call the hilltop block that uh, Ian actually planted, and then next to that is a, an organic block, actually certified by NOFA New York. Um, that Ian and I and, and Kathy Arnick, our enology lecturer, who's here somewhere. Oh, there she is, right there. <laughs> um, that we planted and we use for a class there. So I find it, I, Bob Poole was my nemesis. When I decided I wanted to get involved in viticulture, I said, well, what can I contribute? And I said, probably I can help get some vineyards established because we had none. And uh, I called Bob Poole up and said, Bob, will you tell me what varieties you want? and I want to try to get some plantings established for this new program we're developing. And he said, Merwin, you'll do that over my dead body. <laughs> and uh, he was furious because he saw viticulture was Geneva's thing and he did not want Ithaca to have any of that action. So, so we named the block after him just to, <laughs> this poetic justice, I guess, right? <laughs> um, so, but here it is, and uh, for, that's been great for me the last 10 years, I guess it has been now. I'd gotten to a point in my Apple research where I kind of accomplished a lot of what I wanted to. I figured I got another 10 good years. What can I do that'll make a difference? And uh, it's, been, it's been really fabulous. We got to hire all these great viticulture people, and we got to hire Kathy to teach, and uh, I think we've got a really quality program that's still in the building and of course now we're looking for another person who will be primarily a viticulturist to uh to fill the line that i used to have so and for any home winemakers out there we do sell all the grapes from our student vineyards um and we can actually press them here for you and you can have the juice so you can either have grapes or have the juice um so if you're interested keep us in mind in the fall and bruce did you get to try the cider that was in there didn't make it over. There was such a crowd there. The, uh, I was amazed how fast it went, I must confess. It was, it was two gallons of cider that just vaporized. But uh, the red color, for those of you that did try it, actually was Noir A. I had some Noir A that I, nobody wanted to buy it. And I was looking at it. It was kind of starting to raisin in my cooler. And I said, well, you know, I'm going to throw that in the cider and just see what it does. It has, it's a really spicy grape with lots of color, and I thought it might give the cider some color. And there is just a little touch of Noiré that, if you know what the grape smells like, do you think it's detectable, right? Um, so that was fun. I think I'm going to do it again. I'm not sure I'll use Noiré. I might use something that's not quite as pungent, but... We can sell you something. Yeah, I'm sure you can. <laughs> All right, so I think we should probably head back. Thank you. So. Yeah. This has been a production of Cornell University, on the web at cornell.edu.